So our first speaker is a well-known public figure. He has made numerous appearances on Fox News as recently as last night when he was on the Laura, Laura Ingram show a couple days ago on the Andrew Claven podcast. He's been on CNBC. He, he is a columnist for The Hill and has two books. His most recent is Campus Battlefield. He is the founder of Turning Point USA, which is an which is an organization designed to empower students to embrace free markets and, and, and the benefits of limited government. Turning Point USA has had a major impact and now has a presence on 1,400 college campuses and high school campuses. It has 150 full-time employees and is the largest conservative youth organization in the United States. He has a top 15 podcast and has a reach of over 100 million people on social media each month. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me welcome Charlie Kirk. Hello, everybody. Excited to be here. Um, thank you for having me. So I'm, a, I'm originally from Illinois, so it's nice to be back in the Midwest. The fun thing about being from Illinois is we have term limits in Illinois. It's a little different than most states. It's one term in office, one term in jail. So, <laughs> so when we ask for our governor's cell number, we actually mean his, um, his cell number. My grandmother was a uh, lifelong conservative Republican from the north side of Chicago. She passed away in the mid-1990s, and she's been voting Democrat ever since. So, so you might wonder how a kid from Chicago got on this entire um, very fun and interesting uh, journey. When I was 18 years old, I didn't get into my dream school, which was the United States Military Academy at West Point. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew going to go borrow $100,000 to go study how horrible America was and why there was no God it didn't really appeal to me. So I, I convinced my parents to allow me to take a gap year, and so it's been seven gap years now. And <laughs> Turning Point USA now, I believe, is, is making a serious difference in our country on college and high school campuses across the country. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the people here that have supported us. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I'm seeing and hearing and what we're fighting for. All of you know this, but I'm going to reinforce it. We are in the midst of the most consequential culture war in our country that any generation you know, that recently has ever seen. We have, we have institutions that most of us have funded and have participated in, such as college campuses, that are dedicated to the destruction of our country from within. We have sent our kids there. We have sent our money there. They're, they are, they are indoctrination re-education camps that teach students the most dangerous ideas with such brazen confidence. And so there's a lot of topics I want to talk about today. So I, I, I speak on over probably 50 college campuses every single year. We have a nationwide network on over 1,400 high school and college campuses. We have thousands and thousands of students that attend our events. So I hear what's going on in the front lines. And for this audience in particular, I think this will resonate with you. I want to talk to you about the fastest growing religion in America, and that's atheism. And I, I pray for a day that Christians evangelize and proselytize as much as atheists do. The atheists, the atheists are much more confident in the public square. They evangelize way more than Christians do. They're way more confident in what they believe. And there's a direct correlation with the moral decline of our country and the growth of atheism in our schools. Not agnosticism, but atheism. And I find that on, on college campuses, it's such an appealing thing to teach students because if there's no higher power and there's no accountability, you become the most important person in the world. You can do whatever you want, how you want to do it, because there's, there's, no, there's no accountability whatsoever. And I always joke around, so I have some I have fun with atheists because I think that since we're reborn in the spirit and I, I am an evangelical Christian, uh, Jesus is the savior of the world and my personal savior. So there, there, all this, it puts all in perspective, right? So it's, 
so I, I try to come at it from a happy warrior attitude. So I go on these campuses, and the first thing I always ask when I see the, athe the young atheist students, and mind you, they have more membership, they're more committed, and they work longer hours than the Christian groups on campus. Way longer hours. Like the Christian groups on campus, they're not getting it done. I'm just telling you right now, they are not, I, I know, I'm on the front lines, they're nowhere to be seen. Okay? I've never, I've, I, they're making no difference. The atheists, they're growing like you wouldn't believe. So I go up to these atheists' tables, if you will, and I always have to say, hold on a second, why does this matter to you? I mean, you got like 41 years left, and that's it. Like, the, why does it matter what I believe? I mean, for you, it's absolute nothingness. Why have, why, you, you, you got, you got, your time's running out, man, because if you're right, you, you might as well live it up as much as you possibly can. And because, and the answer, they give me some convoluted answer about how religion is the root of all evil and about how they, I said, but, but why do you even want a better world? Because it doesn't matter what you pass on. I mean, you're, you, there is no spiritual existence. It, you're just nothing more than a clump of cells. You should just go try to be as nihilistic and enjoy it as much as you can. The real answer is this, is that within atheism is an unbelievably miserable worldview. It's, it's, it's insufferably miserable, actually. Because it's a belief that everything is a mistake, everything, that our existence is an act of, ra of randomness, and there is no love, there's no mercy, there's no forgiveness, there's no higher power. Therefore, they're so angry and unhappy, the only way they can cope with that misery is to have other people miserable aside them. It's that old ad adage, misery loves company. That's why they evangelize with as much commitment as they do. So I was speaking at University of Nevada, Reno, on Monday, and an atheist comes up, and she tells me that Christianity is the root of all evil. This is what they teach in our universities, by the way, just so you understand. When you send a kid off to college, there's a high risk that they will become a secular atheist or an agnostic. They'll walk away from the faith, and they're taught with such, such veracity and such commitment from the professors that everything that we know to be true and, you know, the authenticity of the gospel and the story of Jesus Christ and the Bible being the, the direct word of God. That is, that, if you believe that, you are mocked, you are ridiculed, and you are basically indoctrinated to believe the opposite. So I, I had an atheist come up and she was trying to tell me that Christianity, if the world didn't have Christianity, she thought the world would be a better place. That was her entire thing. So she was an atheist and she's saying this publicly and proudly and, you know, all of her friends are applauding her, you know, her courage and her conviction. And so I, I, the, first, the first thing I, I say, which really irritates them, but I say, without God, there would be no atheists. Like, so that one really gets them all screwed up, right? They're all, just, they don't really even know how to handle that one, right? They're, that one really challenges them. And so then, then I, I ask them a, you know, a very simple question, which is, do you hope you're wrong? And so this is the most important question you can ask an atheist. Now, mind you, there's a difference between an atheist and an agnostic, huge difference. So this, this, is, this is so important because more times than not, students will say, no, I hope I'm right. Because, of course, you're, I mean, they, don't want, they don't want to ever be wrong. They want, they, they, they want to be right more than what is good. So if they said, no, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I do believe that there's nothing and this is all just a mistake, then there's something to work with. Because if they, want, if they hope they're right, they hope for what is bad. They hope that there's no afterlife, that there's no mercy, there's no forgiveness, there's no, there's no omniscient or omnipotent power, so that what they're really saying is they want to be God, that they want to crown themselves the singular most important thing ever to exist. What Miserable ex existence when you come up to it. And then, and then of course, I, I, I'll also say, um, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith. To, I, I, I believe it takes far more faith to believe that everything that we hold near and dear to be an act of randomness, the biology, the physics, the mathematics, the position of our earth to the sun, the way our galaxy is put together. So I'm supposed to believe that this was just an off chance that the universe happened to come together the way it was, but believing that there was a creative designer behind this that had thought process and a rational way to put it together, I think that's way more rational and that takes far less faith than actually believing this was all done together by mistake. And, but what, what the universities teach more than anything else, and we'll get into it, it's not even the university, it's because it's the high schools and the grade schools, the left destroys everything they touch, okay? The left destroys, if, if there's only a, again, that's probably one of the more tragic things to remember from my speech, but it's really important. The left has never built anything. The left takes over things, like a virus going into a healthy host. 
The left has destroyed the Boy Scouts. The left is destroying the American church. I mean, I, I show up to my Presbyterian church in Chicago, um, and I hadn't showed up there for like six years. And I, I walk in, it's like Rachel Maddow with organ music. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. And she's talking about how we need to impeach Donald Trump, and, and then we, we, unrecognizable, completely far left wing, gone. They, they've taken it over. And like that, they, they've taken over the schools, they've destroyed the American family, they've taken over the American media, and the left never actually builds anything. They don't. Because by definition, they are deconstructionists. That's actually the philosophy that the left holds near and dear. And so, but we as people who believe in the gospel, and those of you that you know, are more conservative than not, we, in the word conservative, basically is to conserve and protect that which you care about. That's why you're a conservative. You have something worth protecting. Well, the left, they, they want to take things over. They want to change it because they themselves have so much unsettled, they have an unsettled soul, if you will, the only way that they can reconcile that is to go forth and to take over things that they don't currently have. And I was just talking to you know, the Masterpiece Cake Shop. I mean, they're relentless. The fact that they did the first you know, gay marriage thing and they come after the transgender, imagine how unhappy you have to be to continue to go after a couple like that. Do you think that the people that are doing that, the people that are behind this LGBT movement, and we'll get into that whole thing, but the people that are behind that, do you think that they are saying, to God every single day, thank you for giving me life and thank you for my blessing? Of course not, because out of gratitude comes basically all other good things. If you're thankful, then other, you know, you could be patient, you could be honest, but they're, they, have, they have the lack of gratitude, they're angry. In fact, they have jealousy and they have spite. And I think that's one of the major culture wars going in our country right now is that we, we are teaching students the lack of gratitude. And we're teaching them that they have to be, thank you, they have to be artificially, the singular, the singular, person that <laughs> thank you thank you and 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 this battle in America and one of the things that frustrates me most is when people say oh we've been through this before well we really haven't and so this is a really important thing is that I all oh, things go in pendulums we've never had an insurgency within our own country that is this committed to fundamentally changing everything that we hold near and dear. We've never gone through this before. And so I hear on TV all the time, and I have to listen to this garbage, oh, America always bounces back, and we've been through this before. No, we have never been through anything like this before. Post-birth abortion, are you kidding me? Mind you, post-birth abortion, there's another word for that, right? Uh, yeah, th thank you. Post-birth abortion is, is just a way to label it where they can say, oh yeah, we believe in post-birth abortion. Where there's a sitting governor in Virginia who talks about I mean, this is unbelievable stuff, and the media totally covers up, covers it up. He talks about how a baby should be delivered, relaxed. This is the, his own words: relaxed, kept comfortable, and then a decision will be made. The only decision that needs to be made is what you're going to name that child at that point. That's the only decision that needs to be made. If what what make what makes our belief different, and when you believe in a higher power and you believe in an omniscient, omnipotent God, is that when you're not the most important person in the world, and you have, hopefully, God willing, the posture of humility that comes with that, and that you might be wrong, and that you understand that power can corrupt, all of a sudden, the, the, the decisions you make after that, especially the decisions in public policy, start to make a lot more sense. When the left believes that you're the most important person ever to exist, their moral hierarchy says, of course we can get, we can dispose of this clump of cells. Of course we can, because I'm the most important person in the world. And this, this baby within me, or this fetus, and again, I'll get into that in a second, most ridiculous, most deceiving marketing campaign in the history of modern American politics is how we start calling human beings fetuses. Like it's, it's, and I'll, I'll get into that, how this whole thing, we, we just play on their terrain every single time. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, but if, yeah, if you believe you're the most important thing in the world and no one else matters except yourself, then sure, that, then that starts to make more sense. So let's, let's talk about the abortion argument and, and the life thing because I, I comment on this quite a lot. And boy, do these college, there's so much misinformation on college campuses. So I like to have fun with them. First of all, I, I try to ask them, so I asked my first question is, well, what's a celebration called when a, a woman is pregnant? 
and they say a baby shower. Right, so it's not called a fetus shower. So we can just agree that, 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 that the being within is a baby. Like, let's just start there. Another very innocent, logical question. Why is it that, God forbid, and this happens sometimes, when a pregnant woman um, gets murdered, it counts as a double homicide, not as a single homicide. So our laws already recognize that within, the being within, the human being within, is, is a human that deserves protection. Also, um, why is it that all of a sudden a woman could make, could go to a baby shower and then right after walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic and the identity and what that being actually is changes completely from a human being to a clump of indisposable cells? That takes a subjective view of morality that we never, ever, ever should reject. So we have a universally accepted opinion of when, when life ends. We do. I mean, in a consensus, we know life ends, there's a death certificate issued. We don't have that same universally held consensus of when life begins. But you, you could actually argue that's far more important, actually, when, when life begins, because those are the most defenseless people in our entire culture and in our entire society. And so the way that they message it is they say it's a woman's right to choose. So just by basic statistics, again, I never went to college, so maybe someone could correct me. By basic, they say it's a war on women, what they're doing. Well, by basic statistics, the 60 million, right? 60 million abortions since Roe versus Wade, is that right? Might even be more. 60 million. By basic statistics, half of them have been women. So 30 million women, that's a real war on women, isn't it? 30 million women that have been aborted since Roe versus Wade. 30 million women. And again, I also, I hate this whole thing that we have to discount men. And I think there's a whole war on men in our society, and I could get into that for about two hours if you guys have the time. But, um, and... And so it really boils down to this, is that unfortunately, you know, and, and they allow the exception to always define the rule, always. So they talk about statistical occurrences that are the minority of the minority of the minority. When we're talking about, we're talking about less than 1% of 1% dominate the fear mongering of what the left always talks about when it comes to abortion. Abortion was sold to the American public as being clean, rare, and cheap. What were the three words in this? I always get this screwed up. Yeah, yeah, correct, okay. So, um, sure, so safe, legal, and rare. Is that right? Those are the three words. Okay, I always get that confused. Safe, legal, and rare. So now, now it's abundant. It is, I guess it's, I don't, it's legal. It's un, I mean, it's ridiculous. And it's, and it's become a form of birth control. So where it used to be an emergency medical, that's how they sold it, emergency medical procedure. And by the way, the science that existed in the 1960s and the 1970s I mean, it, it's such, it, it's such a, it's hard to put it into words how little we knew back then versus the science that we know today. Two completely different ways to analyze and to view uh, legal interpretations. And so they allow the minority to, to the, the exception to govern the rule, and it's become a form of birth control. So for example, if you see a pregnant black woman in New York City, the higher likelihood she's headed to Planned Parenthood than to the delivery room. The abortion rate in New York City for black women has exceeded the birth rate. Now, mind you, the far left-wing abortionists have told us this would never happen. They told us that this would never become a form of birth control, that this would be something that in extraordinary measures, life of the mother, incest, and rape, that's what they said, but it's, it's not. 99 point, you guys have the numbers, it's 98 or 99 percent of all abortions are a selective abortions based on, um, based on choice because it's, it's, a, it's become a form of birth control. So it's almost like I can do whatever I want to do in my life, I can live, the, and it's going to be just my insurance policy, it's going to be my fallback plan. And boy, I hope all of you guys get involved in what they're teaching in these sex education classes in, in these schools. I mean, they're teaching nine and 10 year olds how to put on birth control in public school. It's unbelievable, if you, you have to see what they're doing. And so Planned Parenthood just said they're going to spend $45 million, $45 million to try to make sure Republicans don't have the Senate in 2020. I have a very innocent question. If they can spend $45 million on trying to make sure Republicans aren't going to be in the Senate, why the heck are we giving them $500 million a year in taxpayer funding? I, I'm, and so, and, and the left, they always say, oh, well, this, this is such an unbelievable, I mean, it's like, if, the, if we had anything of a fair media whatsoever, and the media has become the absolute enemy of the American people, make no mistake, the president is so spot on with his critique of the American media. When they, they say, oh, um, but yeah, we, we need abortion to keep, 
you know, birth rates down. I mean, is, they're, they're literally arguing for a eugenic type policy to limit human production. And I mean, th 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 that's, what th that's what they're saying. And so Bernie Sanders goes out and says, yeah, you know, we need population control. He says this. Senator Sanders comes out and he says this. He says that we need population control. And any sort of rational, moderate thinker does not endorse this belief at all whatsoever. Um, they don't. However, th we, we have allowed for far too long for that entire conversation to get convoluted and to get taken far off track. And so then, then the other part of it, which is always really mysterious to me, is that the left says, well, what are you going to do with all these kids? Like, what are you going to do with all of them? Let's say that, the, you know, all this happens. I mean, first of all, our adoption system is a mess. Our adoption system is an absolute mess in this country. And I think we should talk about that even more. I think that we should have, talk about, and I, I, I just a little bit of a critique of the pro-life movement, because the attack that they, and I, I know a lot of people do a lot of great work in that, but the label and the stereotype I get on college campuses, you guys, oh, you're anti-adoption. I'm like, how could, you, how could you possibly say that? We're very pro-adoption. In fact, I think the $500 million we give the Planned Parenthood every year should be given to adoption clinics. Like, there you go, that's a nice, that, and by the way, every, every major, Every major person in conservative politics should say that over and over again. Repetition is the soul of memory. Let's reallocate the $500 million that goes to Planned Parenthood, and that's an abortion factory, by the way. Planned Parenthood is an abortion factory. And by the way, you could just tell that they love me when I go to college campuses and I talk like this, right? <laughs> they, just, they just absolutely love it. And reallocate that to adoption centers. I mean, it's very, very simple. And so the other thing is this whole thing on college campuses, which is uh, I, the exception rule, you know, governing the rule, is this transgender nonsense that's happening right now. It, it's, 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 it's happening so quickly in front of our very eyes. And I, I mean, I'm seeing this stuff and I, I, I'm wondering, when, when, are the, when are Christians gonna truly rise up against this? I mean, we, we, we haven't, if we fought one one hundredth as hard as the left fights for what they care about, then, then we would start to have some wins and some victories. But this is happening like this. So I, I go on a college campus and I'll say something as innocently as there are only two genders, right? Hate speech, you know, protest, 200 people, you know, th that's it, two, there are only two genders. And so they believe firmly, and the, the universities teach this, and by the way, the universities in your state, University of Michigan and Michigan State University are the worst. They're, they're, they might be some of the worst in the entire country, and I could say that from experience. I, I mean, they, they, they have venom, these students have venom. And if any of you give money to those alma maters, I, maybe there's a good reason for it. Highly doubt that. Um, one of my other closing remarks will be, please stop giving money to any alma mater ever unless you went to Hillsdale or Liberty. Like, those are the only two things you should give money to, okay? Ever. Hillsdale, Liberty, fine. Hillsdale, Hillsdale is a great Michigan institution. Full endorsement, love Hillsdale, okay? The University of Michigan, I'm telling you, I went and spoke there. And um, it's an activist camp. It's an activist camp is what it is. And they are teaching anger to students, anger. I mean, you get these kids from Auburn Hills that come from you know, upper middle class and, and you know, upbringings and conservative Christian schools and they go to Michigan and they're protesting about how America is a racist, bigoted, homophobic country and how we're the worst country ever. And I say this is a uniquely suburban privileged problem that you have everything that you possibly need ever that you have had, you've had vacations and you have access to internet and any sanitation you've ever needed when billions of people live in abject poverty and you're trying to convince people that we live in a horrible country. I say this is like a uniquely liberal suburban challenge that you're trying to put forth here and this is what the university does. Um, and, be, and it all starts, and I'll, it starts from professors that are deeply unhappy themselves and I kind of mentioned that earlier. And so, you know, I, I go, I, I can't, can't remember how I got to that point, but University of Michigan, Michigan State University, when I spoke there, um, the, the venom and the response that I got for espousing these beliefs, the transgender thing, that's what I was talking about. So the two genders, I say that there, and so much, so much backlash, and so these students, we have a rule at all our university events that anyone who disagrees is allowed to go to the front of the line. So at any Turning Point USA event, anyone who disagrees, they go straight to the front of the line. Now, mind you, the left hates free speech. They hate it. The left, the left hates the idea that there are other ideas. You know you are correct, you know you are on the right side when you are starving for people to debate you, when you want and you seek out debate, when you want the Socratic method. So when I go and I'll, you know, I'll have a group of you know, 800 to 1,000 students and the attendance is going up, I have to tell you, there is interest, there is curiosity, there is hunger, there is thirst. My biggest challenge 
is just being able to grow and grow and to reach more people. It's not a messaging problem. You know, I would be super depressed and super pessimistic if I did all these things and like five people showed up, right? I mean, we had, we had 1,300 people show up at Nevada, Reno a couple days ago. We had 800 people at CU Boulder, 600 people. Um, you know, no, oh my goodness, we had 1,000 people. <coughs> Excuse me, University of Florida. It's going to keep growing and growing. And so they step right up to the microphone, and the first thing they always go to is the gender stuff. It's like the first thing. They just can't help themselves because that is in vogue, right? Like that's the new thing. This is the thing that they believe is their civil rights push of their time, um, where biology no longer means anything. So they claim we're anti-science, right? That's one of their big accusations. But at every single term, every single turn from, I don't know, the fertilization of the egg to the XX or XY chromosome, we are the ones that are relying on actual biologically proven science to back up everything we say. And so I ask them, you know, so I say there are only two genders, boos and hisses and all this sort of stuff. And they'll make the argument that gender and sex are not directly related. That sex has to do with, this is interesting when you think about it. So, um, well, it's interesting if you like bad arguments. So, um, so they say gender is, is something that you feel or something that you want to be and that sex is uh, biological. That you can't, you can change your sex through surgery, but your gender is what you choose it to be. And so, first of all, I encourage all of you to listen to my podcast where the podcast was There Are Only Two Genders. I got every single left-wing group in the world protesting me after this thing. I thought it was very rational and very deliberate. I'm sure all of you will agree. But I talk about the 134 different genders that are now recognized at the University of Michigan. 134. 134. Kaleo gender, Apkakanskan gender. No, these are real things. Where people, they believe they're from outer space or they believe that they're... No, so this is real stuff. Not, no parody. You know, I, I, by the way, I don't need to make stuff up anymore. I'm like Adam Schiff, right? I don't need to make stuff up because I, the, the, the truth is just so, it's just right there. So, and so I go through the whole thing. And so then I, I asked them, I said, well, okay, so wh where, where, where on your body is gender? Like, show me where gender is. They say, it's not in my body. It's how I feel. I say, well, so would it be in, in, your, in your brain, maybe? Because it's some, somewhere you're getting this idea that you're not what you say. Yeah, yeah, it, it's in my brain. Okay, so it, it is in your body. Therefore, gender and sex are directly related. And their head blows up when you talk about that. But um, the, the idea that you can, you can, that there's one, the whole transgender argument is one part of it. But the second part of it is the tyranny and the policing of people that just, now might have very specific beliefs in biology and gender, and if you dare challenge that orthodoxy, I mean, in, in California, if you misgender somebody, if you misgender somebody in California, you could serve prison time. So in California, if you use a plastic straw or you misgender someone, prison, gone. But if you cross the southern border illegally, free college, free education, and you can vote. What kind of country are we living in here? I mean, this is... It, it, it's absolutely unbelievable, where if you, you come into our country, you're treated like, you know, Mother Teresa, like, like St. Joan of Arc, but if you say someone, you know, there are only two genders, you could possibly face prison time. And so, how did this all happen? And then I want to open up for questions, because that's my most fun thing, and I want to hear from you guys. Culture, we're in a culture war, okay? Forget politics. Politics super important. I'm a huge supporter of the president. I didn't come here to talk to you about that, okay? President's got to get reelected. That's just a moment in time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. But I know that we're not allowed to endorse. It's 501c3. I get, and I run a 501c3, so we're keeping that aside. That's my own personal opinion. I'm here to talk about culture. Okay, so culture dictates everything else. Okay, culture is downstream from politics. Politics is downstream from culture. Okay, so whatever happens culturally, eventually happens politically. Culture is determined in four major big ways, and the left is winning on all four. All four. Number one is the family. We, as conservatives, have just given up on the family and all family issues whatsoever. We've given up. And if you don't believe me, show me any major conservative in Congress that has said, we're going to rebuild the American family. Here's a set of policies that are going to do it. The nuclear family matters. This is the most important thing. I, I don't hear it anymore. Instead, I hear about corporate tax cuts. Okay, I love tax cuts, okay? I love Milton Friedman. I love all that sort of stuff, okay? That's not what's going to save us. A lower corporate tax rate is not going to save this country. It's just not. Do I want a lower corporate tax rate? Of course I do. I want more money in people's pockets. I want the government to be starved of as much resources as it can from us. I get all that. But is that, is, is that really, is that where Republicans, when Republicans had this Congress and the Senate, they spent all their energy on a corporate tax cut and a little bit of a middle class tax cut. That was their really big crowning achievement. 
when the single motherhood rate in the black community is 74%. 74%. That means that only 26% of black youth will grow up with a father in the home. 26%. I think that has a much higher likelihood of jeopardizing the future of America than whether our taxes are 31% or 26%. Again, not, not discounting the validity of economic freedom. I think, it's perfect. I think it's a perfectly acceptable argument, but we have such structural issues. The family, the left has destroyed the family in this country. We should every single day say we're going to rebuild the American family. From every single leader in here across the country, we need to say in 20 years, we are going to get the fatherlessness rate down 1% a year over 20 years. What does that look like? Looks like the exact same way that they passed gay marriage. The same way, which is advocacy campaigns and legislatures talking about it and grassroots in the streets. And when it seems impossible, it seems impossible. Next thing you know, gay marriage is everywhere. Remember? Like, remember, we, we defeated it in the States. We, all of a sudden, next thing you know, it's everywhere. And if you dare disagree with it, you believe you know, in traditional marriage, then forget about it. Right? And that the left is so patient. The left is so strategic. And they won. They won on that issue, and they win on so many others. And so that's the first thing, is, is, is rebuilding the American family. The left has intentionally destroyed the American family. The nuclear family is the most important institution in the history of humanity that we have now sacrificed. We have sacrificed it completely to the collectivist left. We have allowed the left to determine the rules of engagement when it comes to the family. And fatherlessness is one of the major issues behind that, and it's two-pronged. It's the war on men in America, which exists, but it's also that we allow men to be cowards in our society. We allow it. We, we glamorize it. We don't, we don't talk about what true manhood actually is. It goes around with the moving of the goalposts of the moral structure of our society where it goes from you could do whatever you want to do in college and act however you want to act, and we glamorize it through our film and our media and all that other thing. So first thing is the family. The left has absolutely destroyed the American family. We have to find some way to reverse that, and the church is fundamental, which, speaking of which, is number two, the American church. The, church, the second way that culture is determined is through religious, voluntary community associations. The American church is basically only being kept alive thanks to a robust, evangelical movement. It's, ba it's barely keeping the Christian movement alive and uh, the, the church alive. And this church is a great example of what needs to continue to exist in our country. The left, they have George Soros funded pastor campaigns to get far left-wing pastors into churches and parishes all across the country. So Soros is not comfortable enough just winning at the ballot box. He's not comfortable enough just winning in the schools. He now is funding things through the Gospel Coalition to allow pro-choice social justice pastors to go into the churches and to infiltrate them at every single turn. It, this, this is proven. It's verifiable. It's public. Documents are all out there. And the church is taking a radical left-wing turn. I spend a lot of time around a lot of young Christians. I'm an, I'm an outspoken Christian and people criticize me or they commend me or they challenge me. Those are the three big things I get when, I, when I'm a Christian. When I meet young Christians, I will tell you, without a shadow of a doubt, 70 to 80 percent of them are far left wing. Young Christians are, are falling so unbelievably quick, it's happening in front of our very eyes. In fact, I find that young Christians tend to be more liberal than young secular students. That young secular students tend to be more moderate, if not conservative, Young Christians are being taught that Jesus was a socialist. They're being taught that the, that the government must do socially just things. They're taught that our current system is unequal and that they must play a particular role in it. Now, you might have great examples of how that's not the case. I can tell you, I've spent time at the biggest mega churches in the country where thousands of, these, you know, of young Christians come and it feels like a Bernie Sanders rally where it is laced in social justice. And so I ask you to entertain what I'm telling you because I wouldn't tell you anything that I'm not seeing true. And guess what? The data shows it. Do you know what the number one candidate that young Christians prefer right now? Pete Buttigieg. Young Christians is the number one candidate. Pete Buttigieg is the number one candidate that young Christians prefer. Number one candidate. It's not, it's not you know, Trump. It's not, any, nope, it's Pete Buttigieg who talks about scripture, who talks about how he, no, he does, he talks about it all the time. There's not a speech when Pete Buttigieg is not up there saying that the true way to live out the gospel is to vote like a Democrat. No, this is really what he talks about, or to be a far left winger. So the church is unbelievably important fight, and we've, we've, we've allowed the left to take over so many different parts of it. Number three is the lines of communication. 
we have, we, and we're, we're doing better here. Out of all four of the verticals, this one and the last one is where we're doing a little bit better and the most amount of hope. Family, we have just awful, awful. We have allowed the left to dictate the terms of engagement. The church, we're not doing well. Lines of communication, what do I mean? Washington Post, New York Times, all of them. That's, we're doing really poorly at that. We are doing better on social media than ever before. We really are, thanks to the accessibility of podcasts, thanks to digital creators being able to get their message out. Because right now, I can send out a tweet, and by the time you know, my speech is done, half a million people will have seen that tweet. So the New York Times wishes they could get a half million people to read something that they put into the, in the page. So, but however, the left has traditionally taken over the lines of communication. Now, you show me what stories a culture is sharing, I'll show you what kind of, where that culture is headed. Hollywood and the movies that we show our youth are so unbelievably morally corrupt. And you watch even the Disney movies today, you turn on Nickelodeon, long gone are the days where we glamorize the nuclear family in shows like Full House. I mean, Full House was kind of a goofy show, but the ethos of Full House was not just the nuclear family, but it was supporting people through the extended family was that instead of trying to break up the fan, and everyone has their own different, they fight, that you come together in your differences and you actually all stay in one really big house and the uncles support the, you know, the nephews. And again, it was kind of a silly show, very successful, but the thought process was family does matter, that you voluntarily cooperate. Now you have modern family, where it's a to or desperate housewives. These are now the stories that we communicate to the next generation or we have love and hip hop, which is all about hookup culture and all about having affairs and it's glamorized through all that. Very, very dangerous. You show me the stories a culture is telling, I'll show you where they're going to be in 10 years. We're doing better, however, a lot better on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. The biggest challenge to that is the big tech companies shutting us all down. I'm telling you, access to digital and social media is one of the most important fights because the left is scared, they're terrified that millions of people see my content every single day, that hundreds of thousands are listening to my podcast. They can't control me. CBS, ABC, NBC, they, they mean less today than they ever have been because students are now naturally gravitating towards my content outside of those lines of communication. So access to social media. We're doing better, we're not doing great. The Hollywood piece, we are doing abysmal. We're doing abysmally. I mean, as far as communicating our values through storytelling, we're doing horribly. And the fourth thing, this is where I sp dedicate all my time, how culture is, is shaped and dictated is through education, college campuses, and high school campuses. I, in, in some, every one of those four verticals are important. The most important, I think, is the family and the church, but boy, right up against that is our high school and college campuses because you can have a real, I've seen this and I can prove it, you can have a really strong family, you can have a really strong church, but I've seen 18-year-olds that are, that are grown up in strong families with strong churches and they go to college and they never come back. So it, it invalidates everything before that. And so that's where I dedicate all my time. And we're doing a lot better. Boy, do we have a lot of work to do. So my other thing, I'm going to reinforce this, please stop giving money to your alma mater. Please stop giving money to your alma mater. The second thing is that when you have a student in high school, ask them why they want to go to college, not where they want to go to college. Huge difference. The idea of the cultural expectation that you have to go to college to succeed in our country is dangerous and it is wrong. because. We ask these high school kids, hey, where are you going to school? Where are you going to school? They feel as if they have to go. They could take a gap year. They could join the military. They can go to local community college. They can start a business. In fact, I would argue that we have far too many people going to four-year college universities. The national graduation rate right now is 59%. That means that 41% of kids that go to college will not graduate at all whatsoever, and they'll have debt when they drop out of school. So we're sending 41% of kids a year that will end up being worse off than if they didn't go to college at all whatsoever, not to mention they're learning how much the country, how horrible the country is and how all these sorts of different things. And so, but through the universities and through the campuses, I, I, am, I, I, I insist and I ask you, don't ever give another dollar, get your friends to do the same. And through the state legislatures and through the governor's offices, how little the Board of Regents fight against the left-wing indoctrination is stunning to me. I mean, we, it's absolutely stunning. My guy again, stunning. Um, no, it's important. I mean, I, I was just at University of Florida uh, with Donald Trump Jr. and, you know, we were doing an event there. And I, I, I've never seen a university mistreat a speaker as much. Um, so, so 500 kids, about 1,000 kids show up, 
500 protesters show up and, and yell throughout the entire speech. No one is kicked out. No one is removed. Ruins the entire event for everyone. So the protesters win. And I, 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 I try not to get angry easily. It's one of the things I've had to work, you know, work on. I've gotten better at it, a lot better. Actually, I try to be patient. By the way, if you want to see some funny videos, see the ones where the protesters are screaming in my face. It's, all, it's, a, you know, it's one of the things that I, I love to do, um, get screamed at by leftists. But I, I go up to this university, and I'm so upset. The Board of Regents, they say, oh, there's nothing we can do. I'm like, you can kick them all out. This is your university. I mean, what kind of place is this? And I see this at Michigan and Michigan State University. We have allowed the left to, in, to control the, the terms of engagement there. So that's so important. And the other thing is this. For any new parents out there or people that are considering, I honestly believe, and it's something that I will do you know, in the future, I think homeschooling is a solution to a lot of this. I truly believe this. I really do. I think that we need to make big goals, right? The left is so good at making big goals. And we, I understand why conservative Christians aren't good at this. Because the most important thing in our life is our relationship with God, our own personal journey, our family, our church, and our community. We, we, we don't think like collectivists, and that's actually a good thing. But I'm imploring you that we need a John F. Kennedy, we're going to get to the moon moment. So the two big things I think Christians need to do, and it needs to be done through our big leaders, number one, we've got to get the fatherless rate, fatherlessness rate down over the next 20 years. 1% a year for 20 years. One per, and, and by the way, all of you can play your own personal role with any relationship you see that's about to be broken and try to mend it and try to insert yourself and try to do what you can to make sure fatherlessness does not happen. Because when fatherlessness happens, higher, li higher likelihood of poverty, higher likelihood of crime, higher likelihood of gang membership, higher likelihood of opioid addiction, alcohol abuse. Fatherlessness is such an epidemic in this country, so do your part. The second thing, though, is over the next 10 years, we need to double the amount of parents that are homeschooling their kids. We need to double the amount of people that, that voluntarily go into homeschooling. Double it. The, that's, that's, that, that is one of the most the best ways that we can put a hedge against the growth of the left and the state because they want to make government their God. They really do. They want government to be the new church, and they want to worship the state. And so those are the two big challenges that I issue. So let's do some questions. Is that okay? I don't know how long I talked. I don't know, but anyway, so. No, what, whatever. I, I don't know. Is there a, is there a mic there? Thank you. I'd love. I'll, can I do questions? How much time? Well, we do got I about have? 15 minutes. If anybody okay. wants to That's step fine. up, I'll, I'll go till they kick me out. So he said uh, it's really interesting when a protester yells at him. Anybody want to? Oh no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> sure. So is, is that? Do you want to just start here? Uh, oh yeah, sure. Here actually. And then I guess you can line up here. I, I don't know. I apologize, system. but this really angers me. I agree, homeschooling is the, the option, but we are paying taxes. We deserve a public school that accommodate our kids as well. There should be a way that these uh, ideological things need to be removed from the schools. I don't think we should give up our rights to the public school. Well, look, and I think we need to fight harder. I tend to agree. So every, uh, everyone should run for school board. Everyone should do that. Um, the likelihood of that is lower. Here's the thing I like about homeschooling, though is that it's, it, it doesn't take step A, B, and C, and D. It just, it can, anybody in this room can, not, I, I understand there's other challenges and stuff, but the idea I like about homeschooling is that it could be immediate. If a family, com it, if a family commits to it, it can happen. The idea of taking back our public schools, that's a very long-term challenging thing. And by the way, it's also Republicans that are the ones that get in the way of the current system. And so a, a very simple thing is allowing the money to follow the child, that your local tax dollars should be allowed to be reappropriated to the educational choice of your place. So, that, so the best way you do that is, okay, I'm paying $4,000 a year in property taxes or $1,000 a year in property taxes, uh, or maybe even more, because who knows. Um, I want to be able to have that money go to the private school of my choice, the parochial school of my choice, or the home, or I want it to be rebated back to me so if I'm, re, if I'm homeschooling my kids, it, it, is, it is not in any way representative of a citizen government when you are a citizen of a state or a county and you pay into something and you choose that your child is going to be homeschooled that money should be able to re be rebated back to you you are no longer you're not deriving benefit back from that quote unquote public good now the left goes nuts when you talk about this because they talk about funding mechanisms they talk about all this sort of stuff here's the counter argument very simply if you cannot educate a student for enough people that are going to that school, your system is not economically viable. 
Every private school is able to keep itself neutral by how many students go into the private school. An average private school, and I don't know the numbers around here, so cost of living adjusted, but I'll go to Chicago numbers, okay? Can edu average private school can educate a kid for about $7,800 to $8,000 a year on average. An average public school, $23,000 a year on average. So you get rid of the waste, the fraud, or the abuse, abuse, you hire better teachers, you fight the teacher unions. One of the mechanisms of that is what's called a parent trigger, which allows a parent to pull the trigger and rebate the tax funds. Is it realistic in a state like Michigan? Maybe eventually. I mean, I've seen some things here I never thought I'd see, like right-to-work laws, which are terrific. I never thought I'd see right-to-work in Michigan. It's absolutely unbelievable. But in states like Wyoming and South Dakota, we've started to see this idea of the rebate of tax dollars. That's, that's, the better, that's the better focus than saying we're going to take back our public schools. You're going to be fighting leftists all throughout there. The better way is to defund it and get the money back where well, you speaking, want it to Speaking of... Yeah. <laughs> so my numbers were about right. That was about it. And wouldn't it? And wouldn't it be nice if those tax dollars you already pay could be delivered to this? That would be amazing. <laughs> Senator Colbeck. Well, that's actually what I was working on with my education savings account. So anyway, I. Appreciate it. And by the way, I want to make sure everybody understands the reason why all these attacks upon Christians with Christians with biblical worldviews is such a big deal to leftists is because of folks like Charlie Kirk. He is fearless. He goes into these and highlights their arguments in a way that's kind but firm and he knows what he believes. They can't stand us Christians because there's a certain fearlessness. We're not supposed to you know, God's always saying 63 times in NIV, do not be afraid, and you're a prime example of why they're so Thank out you. to get us. So. And by the way, thank you for the plug on Right to Work. I appreciate it. I, uh, I, uh, I want to highlight something that was near and dear to my heart. When I was in the legislature, we were working with Turning Point, we were working with Goldwater Institute and uh, Stanley Kurtz on free speech legislation to make sure that we'd have a balanced presentation of issues. Now, the whole idea of free speech codes at universities is nuts anyway because we have something called this First Amendment, but we're living in the world that we have. So I was wondering, you, you talked about how we're growing in our, you know, the people that are kind of receptive to the message, or maybe not receptive, but are engaging, which is frankly what I think we need to do. University is supposed to be little laboratories of thought. And right now, they're just trying to suppress this That's message. Correct. How successful are we when we get into a university? I mean, I've seen the fruits of Liberty. I've seen the fruits of Hillsdale. Liberty is terrific. But in other areas, when you're able to get in movement on these free speech uh, codes, if you will, um, how receptive and what's been the reception when we've actually had that? Do you see more growth in those yeah. areas so than I'll others? tell you a very quick story, a fun one. Um, and Dinesh will get a kick out of this. Dinesh is in the back. He's an American hero. He does great stuff. Um, I'll give you a shout out, Dinesh. So, um, so I'll give you a quick story. On a bright sunny day this last February, our Turning Point USA group was tabling at University of California, Berkeley. Now tabling is the exercise of setting up a physical card table like the one you're sitting at, having little pamphlets and trying to recruit other students to your cause. That's when I, when I use that word tabling. And so we had about six or seven students. Now, mind you, never in the history of Turning Point USA and never will we think we're going to be the ideological majority at University of California, Berkeley. We still show up. We're still recruiting. The happy warriors are out there. What ensued was a very angry leftist. I repeat myself, but um, an angry leftist, same thing. So comes up, and you probably saw what happened next. The guy comes up and smashes our kid in the jaw. Do you remember seeing this video on Fox News once, twice, 200 times? So smashes the kid in the jaw. Our Turning Point USA group gets the entire thing on film, texts it to me immediately. Um, the media didn't want to cover it, so I tweet it out. So uh, then it also it goes everywhere. Right? The power of social media is unbelievable. It's an unbelievable blessing. And it has lots of downsides, a lot of cyberbullying, all that, but it has some upsides like this story right here. So it goes totally viral, and Fox News starts to cover it and all this. So the university, in typical fashion and form, they, they, they refuse to go arrest this kid. 
Okay, so it, it was actually the best thing they could have possibly done. Like Berkeley gave us a gift because then we started, we branded it as like a vigilante manhunt. Like we got to go find this kid. And so for two weeks, we kept the story alive. Like, where is this kid? And if you haven't seen this video, I mean, he gets smacked. I mean, when I mean smacked, it's stone cold clocked. I mean, it just, it just because he, he was just tabling very peacefully, like, hi, you know, do you like conservative values? Do you like free market? Boom, just gets absolutely clocked, to, you know, leftist right up there. And um, huge, like, black half of his face, you know, it has, you know, has a concussion, all that sort of stuff. And so we start this entire, you know, campaign to find this guy, and Berkeley refuses to go f arrest him. And so somebody who watches Fox News, a lot of Fox News, a lot of Fox News saw this. And um, a very important person who watches a lot of Fox News. And it angered him a lot. And so he took to Twitter and outrage, you know, someone who also uses Twitter a lot. <laughs> and was outraged by this and makes an announcement of something we at Turning Point USA had been pushing for since our inception, which was to try to get federal universities to be able to be defunded if they don't protect the First Amendment rights of their students, right? So eventually they arrest this kid and he's still, they put on like minor charges and the, the, the charges might get dropped. It's so unbelievable, it's just so sick, so unbelievable. But anyway, what ends up happening is the president signs this executive order. We're there in the front row, turning point, all of our students are there, it's this huge win. And I'll tell you, ever since that executive order has been signed, in fact, I have a video to prove this, within hours, universities, is, is, we started to get emails, bing, 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 oh, our turning point group is approved at Indiana University. Our turning point group is approved at Texas Tech University. Like, like this, like this, like this. We can't, like, on the, is, is that, that's, that's funny, like, why all of a sudden we got like 19 chapter approvals? Because the president goes up there and he's like, if any of these schools dare to go after you, they're done. All their funding is gone. Like, you know, so, and look what happened. So, I, it played a very, very big role, I'll tell you. And uh, it's still playing a big role. These universities are finally on defense and they should be. Uh, their endowments should be taxed. Their board should be cut. Their staff should be reduced by 60 or 70 percent. These are, these are dangerous, dangerous places for our culture. So anyway, that's a fun story of how we've played the free speech fight in 2019. We've done a lot of things we're really proud of. That's near the top of it, I have to be honest with you. Um, but I'll give you some optimism that the amount of radical, outspoken socialists on a college campus are decreasing in number but increasing in volume. And the issue is not the socialists. I have to, it's not the students. The issue is the pandering administration. This, the administration are the absolute problem here. And by tangent of that, the Board of Regents and the donors who support these universities, they pander to these kids. You're always going to have the self-righteous, loud kid. That's always going, it's not going to disappear, okay? That's just built in to the human population. You're going to have 10 to 15% that want something to rebel against. What's not built in is you need adults that tell them, stop it, behave yourself, and go back to class. Like, you, just you, stop it. That's what you need. That's the difference. And, but I am I'm experiencing more curiosity than combativeness. I get more students that attend with an open, there, there is a movement happening of liberation of thought. It's beginning to happen on these university campuses. And we're not the majority opinion, but we have way more kids today than we did five years ago. Generation Z is trending to be more conservative because it's a response to the culture, just the culture wreckage that the left has wreaked on this entire country. And so th that's why you see people like Dinesh, like Jordan Peterson, like Ben Shapiro, like myself, like auditoriums full of students that waiting lines because they just want very simple, well-delivered, rational truths that they're not getting at all. Um, and so that's my optimistic message for all you guys. But my biggest challenge every single day I'm going to be honest with you, is fighting these institutions that have been funded by wealthy conservatives that are boarded, essentially all the boards are wealthy conservatives. If, if conservatives just understood this a little bit, I'm talking about the wealthy donor conservatives, we'd have a totally different issue. I, went to, I, I spoke at Stanford and I walked around. Business school, engineering school, all, the, all these schools are named by conservative donors. Every single one of them. So our own people are funding the very institutions that are then destroying our country from within. 
boy, I mean, what would happen if instead of giving $22 million to Stanford, they could give $22 million to your wonderful school here, you know, in Michigan, right? Like, that would be a better place to put it. Or, or $22 million to Hillsdale, or $22 million to Liberty. And there's a whole, I could write a whole book about the psychology of why donors give money to their alma mater, but it boils down to this. They want to show their classmates that they were the most successful graduate. That's really what it comes down to. Look how good, of, look how successful I was. I could talk forever, like I said, so we'll do one more, so. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I am an employee of a major state agency. I won't say which one. Uh, most of us deal with them, though, about every time, uh, about every year in April, in Kent. <coughs> um, a few years ago, they created an Inclusion and Diversity Committee, which in the past we've had a gay, lesbian, uh, GBTQ Appreciation Day, or coming out time. A few weeks ago, we had a Women's Equality uh, Day, which featured flyers of uh, con female congressmen, all, all Democrats. AOC was included in one of those. Uh, we've also had a Hispanic American Day. And now we know that management is considering bringing in to talk a MSU professor, sociology professor, who in the past has talked about the dangers of microaggression. Or, so, as an employee, me and other people who have traditional values or object to this sort of thing, we struggle between saying something and taking a stand and risking our jobs. So what I'm doing now is just making people aware of not only does this sort of stuff, this radicalism, go on campus, but it's in our own bureaucracy. Not the, not the legislature. You vote Democrats out, Republicans come in, we still have it. This started two years ago under Rick Snyder. Thank you. Okay, well, let's get a question, I guess. We want a question. Does anyone have a question? Okay. Hmm? Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So I'm, I'm kind of bothered, um, worried about certain things. So here's my concern. Um, we all know the differences between uh, collective, uh, collectivism and uh, individualism. And how can we embrace the power of the two forces or differentiate the pow power of the two different you know, aisles? I'm, I'm worried by thinking about those two terms is really based on I see the uh, big corporates, uh, globalized uh, corporates, especially in the media industry, they kind of try to swipe our uh, opinions. And two, in the ec economic, uh, economy uh, world, some state-owned oh, some don't know what's going on. So some state-owned uh, powers are taking over our individ individual or uh, business I, I, I think we, yeah, we need, world. We need yeah. a question. If you okay. have a question, go ahead and ask. Okay. So, so my question is, how can we balance or uh, enforce the? Uh, uh, force and the power of indi individualism uh, f fight against collective. Okay, yeah. so I, look, that, that is yeah. the struggle of our time. Uh, yeah. are, are you going to be angry or thankful you live in America? Are you going to be a victim or a victor? And so I appreciate the sentiment and the, the, left, the left wants our country to look much more collectivist and much more status than it currently is. And that's, that's why they're trying to destroy the church and that's why they're trying to destroy voluntary institutions. So um, if anyone is interested in getting more engaged or more kind of following what I'm doing, two things. I have a podcast that comes out three times a week. If you have a smartphone, you can subscribe to it on your podcast app, The Charlie Kirk Show. Every time a lot of people subscribe, it drives the New York Times nuts because we beat them every single week. So, uh, and if you don't know how to do it on your phone, uh, find a millennial in the room. They could help you do that. And um, our website is tpusa.com, tpusa.com, if you guys want to learn more about the work we're doing. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. As long as it's quick. Austin, Austin, ask your question, but it's got to be a question and it's got to be quick. Very, very quick question. I'm a pastor. I have a teens and 20s group that meets in my uh, home on Mondays. Seven different churches are represented in that. What are you guys doing, not just in speeches on a college campus, but in your groups that you have, what are you doing to promote natural law, Western culture, and Christianity? I myself was a uh, product of a Christian ministry on campus. 
what are you guys doing? Quite a lot. I mean, we are trying to get Western civilization back into the schools, of which they've eliminated altogether. And mind you, the presence of us being, I mean, Turning Point USA, I'm a Christian, however, our charter is not Christian in nature. We're a secular organization. But we have brought more light to you know, these campuses by even being a secular organization than the Christian organizations do. I have never seen not once a Christian organization on campus be active or to do anything, even a micro, of what we're doing. I'm just going to be honest. The like Christian college activism is one of the most depleted, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's a couple out there. I don't want to say that they do poor work. I've never seen them, ever. And I'm, I'm on the front lines every single day. And so we're doing a lot to promote that sort of stuff. You're basically doing like natural law theory, Puffendorf? Yeah, look, from the Scottish Enlightenment to John yes. Locke, Bacon, Hume, Descartes, you and I could talk about all those things that we talk about. They don't teach those in our schools. But we talk about how rights come from God, not from government, talk about why the Bill of Rights is written the way it was, and so on and so forth, from Augustine to Aquinas, why Plato was wrong and why Aristotle started it all. You and I could get a lot in common. Thank you guys so much. This has been a lot of fun. So thank you.